that has been doing Agile stuff for quite a few years, and I'm very pleased and happy to be here today with you to share some of my ideas and to hear some of yours. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion now and perhaps other discussions as we go forward. So one of the things that we talk, we hear a lot about these days is Agile portfolio management. Um, a lot of, you know, we also hear about scaling Agile to the enterprise. And we also hear more and more about um, the cultural issues that are associated with uh, adoption of Agile stuff. And um, what we hear about that when you're doing Agile on a team or doing it on a program, but as you get into broader engagement, you often run into uh, what we might call cultural issues or hard ways to develop alignment. But really the problem is the real big payout for Agile investment is the broader scale adoption, is the Agile, um, the ability to use those Agile techniques to um, run the, um, uh, the portfolio. So, but we still have to overcome these cultural barriers somehow. So, the traditional business approaches and the agile value approaches need to somehow be reconciled. So, one of the things I'm hoping to do today is provide maybe some ways to make that bridge between the two worlds. And then also, um, for this audience in particular, it's very clear that agile has been extremely successful in software development. And there's a lot of talk about, including the talk right before this one, about how those same ideas and principles could be applied to other areas. And um, if that were the case then, it isn't so much that Agile works well because software is so peculiar, but because there's something that, about software development that is held in common with maybe lots of other things. And in particular, if what that is, or a lot of what that has to do with, is managing through uncertainty it could very well be the case any time in any other domain where we have to manage through uncertainty, we could draw upon the value of Agile principles. So that's what I want to explore today. Another thing I want to do is just talk a little bit is, is from my perspective, and I imagine a lot of you share this with me, is we think about where did Agile come from? There's really two big traditions. Uh, one of them is lean, and one of them is complexity theory. And it's really kind of almost a mashup of a lot of these ideas that have given us the Agile stuff that we use today. And there's so much discussion in, um, about Agile today and scaling Agile today that it's lean, 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 lean. Um, I sometimes get concerned that there's actually not just lean. There's actually other things that are fundamental and extremely important to consider, especially, I think, when it comes to managing uncertainty. I really do believe it's not so much that scaling Agile means just go lean. Everything that's in Agile could be in lean, but I think they complement each other quite a bit. And especially when you look at lean from a waste reduction perspective, as uncertainty rises, the danger for very great, great waste increases. So there's a very good partnership between those two concepts. And I think that is one of the reasons that the Agile approach has been so powerful. But today what I want to focus is less on the lean side, more on the complexity side. The other thing too is when we talk about um, where does business culture come from, where do management principles come from, they really come from um, some basis of a world view. And then from that basis of world view, management principles come up and they then produce practices and governance ideas and finally we do the work. So what I want to do now is kind of talk about, if from a traditional business ideas and principles, where has that tradition come from? I want to start talking about a guy named Frank Knight, in, um, who was the first person who really made a big point about making a difference between risk and uncertainty. And when he talked about risk, what he talked about was the idea that you may not know for sure what's going to happen, but you have a pretty good idea what the probability of the different events are going to be. Like the perfect example of that is throwing dice. Is you don't know for sure if you're going to get two sixes or a three and a two, but you know the probability of what you're going to get. And when people talk about risk, that's really what they're talking about. They're talking about the ability to make a projection into the future, but that's based on probability distribution informa information that is applicable. 
And that kind of way of thinking, which also is very closely related to the idea of maximizing utility and expected value computations to figure out what is the potentially greatest value um, that a risk uh, uh, managed, if you will, is very much a foundational block for how we approach business investment. It's, it's really where classic risk management techniques come from. Um, the idea of the threat matrix, what's the probability of the threat, what is the cost of the outage, multiplying that out. That's when we think about risk management, it's very hard to separate out this idea of probability distribution and computation of value from an expected value perspective. It's also how we think, when we think about rational decision making, this is what we're talking about. And it's the approach traditionally that's taken in building business cases for business investments. Now on the side of uncertainty, what that's, that's really in terms of what uh, Knight said, he says that's something else. That's essentially when you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know the probability of something happening either. And so it doesn't hit that threshold of being able to apply any kind of rational decision making. It's simply uncertain. And he said at that point that, you know, when no one explored that very much, we're not really sure, this is back in the 20s, you know, what we should do with this. But most of the approach that people take is when they see uncertainty, when they don't know enough, they simply avoid that and do something else. And in fact, the idea of embracing um, uncertainty is considered irrational, almost the definition of, an, of, of irrational. So what I want to do now is just kind of um, talk a little bit about where some of these, this risk analytical worldview, where does that come from? What's a, what's a way of looking at that from a broader perspective? And we were just talking about Frank Knight, risk, uncertainty, and profit. Now I'm going to go back a little bit in time to 1776 uh, for Adam Smith in Wealth Nations. And I'm sure many of you have heard of that before, and it's uh, referred to all the time. In a sense, it's kind of like the birth of capitalism, in a sense, so a way of a model to think about how people operate in the marketplace. And it's very much predicated on this idea of people rashly making decisions to do what is in their best self-interest. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. There's also the principles of scientific management, sometimes called Taylorism. And this is this idea that often comes up in Agile conferences, et cetera, this whole notion of work, which is essentially mechanized in that what people are are kind of like labor units, and you're trying to optimize how much value you can get out of them by extracting that labor by applying optimal mechanistic kind of algorithms to them doing work. But it's very consistent, too, with this kind of mechanized idea of what people do and how people operate. And then the Harvard Business Re Review, which everybody knows about, um, was founded in, in the 20s. And probably more than anything else, it's kind of the symbol of taking the idea of business and applying analytical techniques to run businesses. That's very much the culture, the MBA culture. Apply analysis, make good um, calculated decisions, go forward. And then there's the theory of, of game and behavior. This is by von Neumann, the same von Neumann of computer science, did a lot of different things. And in this particular case, he, he was one of the kind of co-inventors, you might say, of game theory. And this is this idea of setting up simulations where, if you will, rational agents work things out. And again, the assumption is, is that they're pursuing their um, individual interests. So a lot of these ideas, and then finally, in, the, in 1971, B.F. Skinner, you know, a psychologist that most people have heard about, um, uh, who really focused the attention of psychology not on the mind, but on what could be observed. And the, the whole idea there was is that the same reductive principles that people use in physics and chemistry should be applied to the observation of human and animals. And if you do anything else, it's nonsense. So, so it's not only that people act rationally but you can't learn anything about people if you don't just observe them as you would be observing atoms, for example. Put all this stuff together. It's kind of this, it's where this risk analytical worldview has come from, which started, you know, two, three hundred years ago, perhaps even earlier, and really matured and came into the maximum in the early part of the 20th century. So let's look at what uncertainty then is how would you define that from a risk analytical perspective? And to a large degree, what we could do is say that risk is simply the absence of knowledge. Um, the, the 
risk analytical perspective takes kind of an enlightenment perspective about knowledge, which is essentially that you can learn things, and as you learn things, ignorance goes away. To a, certain, to a large degree, what uncertainty is, is simply that you haven't learned yet. When you will learn that, then the uncertainty will go away. And there's automatic progression. As knowledge accumulates in society, progress is made, and things work out. When you don't have enough knowledge to make a rational um, compute the risk, if you will, then that's what uncertainty is. Knowledge in the risk analytical world is very much the kind of this idea of scientific facts. These are enduring facts that you can fit into forms to develop causal relationships. And, and this is really how you estimate the risks and you make your predictions. One of the key components of this whole idea is taking a logical analytical per perspective of analysis of the environment and facts is that there's one and only one right answer. There is a best answer. By definition, there is a best answer and it can be discovered through analysis. The other idea is that the same, same people will come to the same conclusion because it's all objective, it's all analytic, and essentially it's just the way the, the world is wired. People too um, are pretty much uh, the same in the sense that they're rational, self-interested, utility optimizing machines. Um, this is, it's almost like you can imagine little Dr. Spocks from Star Trek. That's what people are, and that's like the ideal form of a person, all trying to pursue their individual interests. And now, yes, there are things like individual differences, emotions, impulses, but that's considered variance. That isn't really considered how you characterize what people do. What characterizes what people do is optimizing utility in a rational way. The other stuff is kind of noise, or it's waste, or it's weakness. Now, when you take it from a social perspective, um, and we're going to go back to um, Adam Smith, who had the famous idea of how he talked about unintended consequences. And what he said is, is that everybody in the society, the baker, the candlestick maker, whoever they are, they pursue their individual interests, and by doing that, automatically the maximum amount of wealth will be generated for the society. And he said, so they, and he, that's how he defined unintended consequences, that um, they didn't want to do that, but a side effect of doing that is the greater good for everybody. And this is this, this, uh, this idea of the invisible hand that's guiding society. And it's very much becomes the, you know, almost an article of belief these days in capitalistic and democratic societies that it's based on all this idea that the world should be a level playing field, that government or anything else should interfere, let people work it out in the free marketplace, laissez-faire capitalism, and the best outcome will happen. That's the pure theory. This is where it began. Now, the idea of work in, from this perspective is, is very much comes out of the manufacturing tradition. It's very uh, production focused. And the value that people contribute is their labor. And this labor is something that's essentially a commodity or, fu or fungible. When I say fungible, I like to use this idea of the fungible work machine. And basically what that is like a function. You put certain things in, in the input and you get a consistent output on the other side. And the thing about the fungible work machine is that if you switch the person in and out, it won't have any impact on the results. So essentially people are fungible units, they do the work. And that's really considered good. That's considered op optimizing, getting real clarity in terms of what you're trying to um, obtain from an efficiency perspective. So together this stuff makes up the risk uh, analytical world. And this really, this risk analytical world then is the foundational worldview that the management principles that are traditional management principles come from. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what those principles are. Um, one of them, identify the best solution. Okay, as we said, in principle, you, it can be discovered, so you should achieve it. You should get it up front. And you should cent centralize information rather than distribute it in centralized management decisions because you're going to go all the same conclusion anyway. There's no value in distributing things out. Since analysis will yield to the same conclusion, centralize, get it done, figure out what the best solution, and then go forward. And you should do things right the first time, by, in principle. Because after all, since you know what you're trying to do, you can come up with the optimal plan. If you can do that, then you should proceed. That's, that's the logical way to do it. And you can apply external constraints down the road. 
That means that once you know what the plan is and the objective, you really can just set up constraints to make sure that whoever does what they do will, be, will do so and um, not go off plan. And you should be able to leverage economies of scale. Because you can optimize the value of what you're trying to do, you can say, well, how can I get the biggest bang for the buck as I do this? And of course, avoid uncertainty. So the risk analytical business philosophy is you centralized evaluation, centralized planning, and then production. You come up with the best solution, you do it right the first time with the optimal plan, and you leverage economies of scale. The objective is to optimize the overall production, and the style is algorithmic. Now, when I say algorithmic, what I mean is, is that it's a very prescriptive um, sequential step process. First, you do the evaluation in a stepwise manner. Then you do the planning. Then you do the production. And it's a sequence. So the risk analytical world, there's the zone of rational inquiry where you do business. And there's that which is outside that zone. So those are the management principles. From a business initiative perspective, you start in a position of manageable risk. The path to the value is clear through the plan. You manage variance and you get your, um, um, and you do what you wanted to do. So we just to look, take a real quick road through this, this is our standard approach, is you do the analysis, you set a charter, you get a comprehensive specification, you implement the plan, there's a little bit of variance, but essentially you get the outcome that you expected because you're able to do the analysis up front, set up the external constraints, and it worked. Now from a risk analytical governance perspective, you have the project charter, which constrains the work to what the business case said. You then have detailed plan and specification, which constrains the production to the specification. And then you take the big bang release to try to get the maximum utility out of the, out of the um, release. Risk is to manage, and uncertainty is to avoid. So this functional work machine really is, um, is, is, set the, is, is provided a way to live in this world of risk analytical business culture. From this perspective, competition will gradually eliminate the low risk opportunities. Prudence dis dictates that you don't um, go into the uncertain zone. So really, you exploit business opportunities in this risk manageable area. And objective inquiry will generate opportunities. Let's... Excuse me a second here. But what if that doesn't happen? Um, today, we hear a lot about business uncertainty. Um, over the last, last year, I don't know if it's still the case, but US, the large US corporations are sitting on more cash than they ever have in history. So they have more cash in history, even though the economy is down. And the reason is because they haven't been investing. And out of this, this, this kind of worldview that we're looking at, that's what prudent dictates. It's too uncertain to invest, so you don't invest. But it still doesn't really play with what we should expect because we feel as, as progress continues, we learn more and uncertainty should re be reduced, not increased. So is this just an anomaly or is something else going on is the question. So we can talk a little about what's driving business uncertainty. So let's take a little bit and look at the history of technology very, very briefly. We start with the Stone Age and the invention of the wheel. In ancient Greece, finally came up with the principles for rational inquiry that became the foundation for technology and science in the future. And at this time, technology is evolving and it is increasing, but it's doing at such a slow rate, it doesn't seem like it. The change of technology is so slow that the things that are technical things in, that, in your society um, don't move. So it's like the watching the hour hand that doesn't change when you're looking at it. The Renaissance, we have our printing press, we get to the steam engine, and then in the 20th century, the, that rate just shoots up. And so you go, wow, what's going on here? If this were 
if, if like a thousand years ago, the rate of technology was so slow, it was almost like evolution, is there's animals out there and they don't uh, change in any noticeable way, so does the, um, now the technology changes so quickly, it would almost be like you, you go to sleep at night and you wake up the next day and the, the animal has changed into something else. So if we look at, in this graph right here, what we see is, is, is how many years for subsequent kinds of technology is taken for 25% of US households to adopt that technology. What we see is, is that radiation of new technology is, is moving forward very, very quickly. We all know good old Moore's Law, which sets that foundation for a, a broader and broader, um, um, cheaper, more comprehensive memory and computing power, which drives this technology change. And as the rate of the technology chain goes up, it puts pressure on product life cycles. It's just a case, we look at MySpace here, and in two, three years, up into the tens of millions of users. Then we see Facebook popping up. It's something I remember at the time. Oh, Facebook, yeah, it's like, it's like my face, it's like uh, MySpace, but some university students use it. That's about all I know. And then before you know it, boom, it's, it's taken off. So when you look at it from this perspective, from a traditional approach, you make an investment, you expect to return time that you're going to get that investment. But if the product cycles are shrinking and the investment stays the same, then there's a danger of you losing that investment. And at a certain point, you may even need to reduce the investment to get some unacceptable return. So there's a lot of pressure there. Okay, so technology is changing um, very rapidly, but okay, so why is that a problem? I mean, why, why is that, what's that got to do with things? After all, progress is supposed to get better. Um, maybe the playing, playing field is simply better, and so people can have higher performance, just like tennis rackets today make tennis players much better than they were in the past. But still then, why do things seem to be more uncertain? Why isn't it just that things are speeding up and staying more and becoming more certain? They're not. They're speeding up and becoming less certain. So let's go to New Zealand. Like in, in the middle of the 1800s, somebody introduced the rabbit. And before you know it, there were rabbit plagues that developed. This was an unintended consequence. Now the unintended consequence that we talked about before was that the person that was the candlestick maker or the baker didn't intend to generate wealth for the whole community. This is a different kind of unintended consequence. This is an unintended consequence where it's unexpected. So by definition, it can't be predicted. So what causes these? Well, there's the idea of the platform effect. And this is something, um, if we, in evolution, uh, one of the big problems that I'm sure many people have heard about is if evolution makes these gradual changes, then how could the I ever exist? Where did it come from? And sometimes people come up with the idea of intelligent design as an explanation for that. Well, so there might have been some, there had to been some plan that foresaw that's what it was trying to do. But there's an alternative solution, or, or there's many other explanations, but one of those uh, by Stuart Kaufman is this idea of the platform effect. And that is, is that when there's an incremental change um, just because there's a slight change in the, um, the organism because of uh, a, a change in the DNA, that creates a little bit of a change in the platform which opens up a new kind of opportunity for that organism that didn't exist before. So, and then as time goes on, literally the eye emerges for that kind of random, random walk um, in working with the environment. And we can think about the technology change in the same way, is that when there's a new technology platform, it opens up new opportunities immediately that nobody could have guessed beforehand. And we see this happening to, all the time. We see how cell phones lead to texting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when we think about the technology platform, the large technology platform, the internet, but really everything together, that base just allows things to go quicker and quicker and quicker because it can be leveraged up. But at the same time, it is um, um, it introduces options that no one had anticipated. 
Now the other thing too is, is that in the last 15, 20 years, the idea of like how people are wired has changed quite a bit. So uh, there's a book, A Judgment Under Uncertainty Heuristics and Biases. And what they did is they did a lot of experiments to see how rational people really are. So here's one example. Um, you receive $1,000. Everyone gets 1000 bucks. You get to choose between these two. Now think about this. You can have a 50% chance of winning $1,000 or nothing or 500 bucks for sure. Make your choice. Okay? Now I'm going to give a different situation. You receive $2,000. Now choose between the following. A 50% chance to lose $1,000 or lose $500 for sure. So this first case, most people choose A. In the second case, most people choose B. Yet from a maximum utility perspective, they're exactly the same thing. If you logically look at it, it's the same outcome. But how they're framed, in the one case, it's framed as you're going to get something. In the other case, it's framed you're going to lose something. And that is enough to really change the behavior of people. People hate to lose more than they hate to win. It's in our hard wiring. And there's a host of, of examples of other things. There's, they've done studies where they looked at the length of sentences that judges give. And as they get hungrier, the sentences go up. So if, if people are like really making, they, kind of, they make rational decisions under important circumstances, you wouldn't expect that to happen. And it goes on. And there's many, many different um, examples that really defy logic. David Kahneman, one of the co-authors of this uh, book, received the, the, the first psychologist to receive a Nobel Prize in economics, which really now starts to show where this early 20th century idea of economic marketplace, rational agent, everyone's the same, is now we've got these quirky people out there. And who knows exactly when these quirky people run against this rapidly changing economy, what's going to come out of that. So the accelerating rate of technology change really increases the rate of unexpected consequences. Um, and they have a bigger and bigger, because of the um, platform effect, there's more and more and more unexpected things that can happen. And the nature of these unexpected consequences disturbs what might be just the natural rapid progression towards something and moves it off into some other direction. So this kind of messes up this idea of, of that the world is more or less rationally wired um, and they're going to converge on optimum. That's really that there's a lot of wild cards. Things are changing all the time. And as the technology changes rapidly, then um, uncertainty is going to increase because of unexpected consequences. So this means there's fewer and fewer good bets. Um, but if you don't do anything, it's a problem. Because things are changing so much, what was a secure investment in the past is always, is not necessarily going to last tomorrow. So you have to continue other things. So really, you have no choice but to start to begin to invest now in where maybe 30 years ago from a, from a Harvard MBA uh, perspective would have been an imprudent way to invest money. So if, um, uncertainty is inescapable. Um, the, we can't avoid it like we could with the risk analytical approach. And this is a different kind of uncertainty. It can't be avoided. There's a lot of it, and it can't be predicted. And as uh, technology accelerates, un unintended consequences start to breed like rabbits and really disrupt this rational analytical ecology. So what do we do? Well, we've kind of talked about how it doesn't seem to fit, but I think the natural inclination is that we just try to fine tune and work out better um, those practices that have worked us in the, in the past. Um, calculating risk is work. Let's apply the same techniques. Let's do it with more, with broader, more sensitive confidence intervals. Let's do it in a more sophisticated way and thereby reduce um, this. And so we're going to just kind of whip through this scenario that we saw before. But now, whereas before we would have had more information, we decided to proceed anyway because it, we, if we don't do anything, it's also a risk. So a shaky, that means we don't have the spec and we all know this story. We have the flawed implementation plan and the progress. There's no way to change, um, to learn as you go. And the uh, outcome is to spend the money, but it's not a, it's not a good um, 
deal. So here we have a situation where the tool maybe is not the best tool for the nature of the problem that we have in front of us. So the question is maybe we need different tools. What we're seeing here is that the work isn't, out outcome isn't working. And what we saw there is that the very governance structure that worked in the traditional approach now impeded success in this later approach. So the practices and governance don't work either. Which means then the management principles may be suspect and even the approach that we've been taking from a world view. So if that's not right, then what should be? So here we're going to go and we're going to now talk about another set of ideas. We're going to start here with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Here in a sense was kind of like the limit of reductive science. Was at this point we finally discovered that there is a limit of, of being able to discover through science direct causal relations. And that wasn't expected. And now what we're going to do, this is the kind of beginning of the chaos um, theory with uh, the whole idea that we've heard so many times about is that the butterfly wing happening here could create the hurricane down the road. Now that may not be literally true, but what it means is, is that there's also phenomena at the macro level, at the larger level, that defies causal analysis. So there's phenomena in the world that just the way science has been conducted in the world, if, the way we've done it in the past, aren't going to help us as we go forward. We've got um, the structure of scientific revolutions was this uh, idea of the par word paradigm was almost invented by this guy. Is the idea that, that people, first of all, scientific breakthroughs don't happen in a rational, linear way. They happen, um, and people, when a new idea hits the scene, people resist it tremendously until it finally breaks through. But when it does, that new paradigm can be a completely different way to look at phenomena that you've seen before. And then, of course, we have fractals. In fact, it's the idea that um, has been applied more and more in complexity theory that very, very simple rules can re be responsible for in incredibly complex uh, phenomena. And we talked about this. Um, Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in the United States, was in 1996, talked about a rational exuberance right before the dot uh, com bust. He was actually a student of Knight and that was that kind of thinking. People aren't acting rationally, but boom, this phenomenon is happening anyway. And then we've got Steve Johnson, who also wrote a book called Emergence that talked about simple rules and swarm behavior. And just, a, I think, a couple years ago, wrote this book, Where Good Ideas Come From, and looked back at the history of technology and, and points out that even though we think of big inventions and technical breakthroughs as being attributed to a single person, that in fact, it almost always is the product of collaboration with many people over a long period of time. So when we started here, we're now here. And this is this summer when the Harvard Business Review on the front cover says embracing complexity. So in a sense, we're starting to see, even though complexity is something that in the Agile world has been talked a lot about, it's, it's really starting to bleed over into mainstream thinking. Um, David Snowden, a few years before that, in the Harvard Business Review, uh, had this quote in, uh, where he inter introduces in the Harvard Business Review um, the Kinefin framework, where he says the time is brought uh, to broaden traditional approach to leadership and form a new perspective based on complexity science. So what might that be? So, like the risk analytical world, we can look at the different um, the um, a complex world and other kinds of worlds we'll talk about here in a second as how they range from a certain to uncertain, but they also diff represent different ontologies. What I mean by that is that water is water. When it's frozen, when it's liquid, when it's gas, it has a really different state, and therefore the tools that you use when it was ice are not going to work so well if when it's liquid or steam. If you were able to walk on ice and you hit um, water, you couldn't, you'd have to go around, you'd have to avoid it. And we can think of um, um, that then as, okay, so as we go from one mode um, from the, and go to the other, we cross over and now the nature of things has changed such that the tools that made sense before no longer apply and we need new tools. 
So very briefly, we could take you know, a simple thing as cause relations are self-evident. As an example, asphalt distributor. Put it on the streets. It's very straightforward. And we take um, as an example of what's complicated is this is very much exactly what we're talking about from that risk analytical perspective, where you take knowledge, you do analysis, make predictions, and, and, and explore, and kind of make bets, and, and see what you can do. Now, these together really very much um, comport with what we were talking about before. But now we're going to go to this idea of complexity. And here now, the solution is an emergent which means that it was not predictable beforehand. And you have to learn as you go. You can't know up front. And the plan is going to evolve with the emergent solution. And, and certainly cannot really be escape. And green energy, I'll use that as an example to make it, you know, and, and where there's all this interest and all this money um, in figuring out how to enter the green energy market. But really, no one knows how it's going to come out. No one knows what the standards are going to be. No one knows what the plant platforms are, who's going to win. Are things going to be done centrally distributed? It's, it's emergent. It's happening, but it's unsettled. And then the chaotic is really essentially that area where there's so much turmoil that just no coherence. There's nothing you can do, um, so to speak, to get some business value from that. So if we look at it, you know, today, where are the business opportunities? The simple business opportunities are long gone, or as soon as a good one pops up, com competitive forces will push it away. Chaotics is the opposite. It really leaves this complex adaptive and risk analytical places. These are the two different worldviews. And so let's look now. We talked about the risk analytical world. And let's now look at the complex adaptive world. How might that be the same or might be different than what we talked about? And as we discussed, when we just look at uncertainty, the root cause of uncertainty is, may not just simply be the lack of information. In fact, emergent phenomena cannot be, have, don't have normal outcomes, yet they're part of the landscape. No amount of research under those conditions is going to yield the best solution. So if we think about knowledge in the complex adaptive world, there's fewer hard facts that we can count on. Things are happening in real time. So there's a huge dependence on tacit knowledge as opposed to hard factual knowledge. This tacit knowledge is the knowledge that's in our brains. It's not somewhere in a book that you can read. It needs interpretation. The value of information is changing and tentative. And different perspectives need to triangulize, if you will, the stuff that we're seeing to make sense of it. And that's how we do with collaboration. And we're we have this different idea of a person is we're not just a robot that's maximizing utility much less the same way. Um, we actually have multiple perspectives. And those multiple perspectives are really important through collaboration to actually understand what's happening with emergent phenomena. And that's, in fact, how emerging new ideas take place. So instead of having all these little agents with the, the um, um, we'll put this together and take uh, Steve Johnson's idea of collaboration as being the way that new ideas emerge. It's, it's really people sharing ideas, thinking about those ideas, going back and forth, which is where value comes from in this complex adaptive world. And the nature of work is, is different too. Whereas before, here we, the operating pra um, uh, paradigm for work isn't so much production, um, but it's more like knowledge work, and it's more design than manufacturing. Here, the, the, as he's mentioned, the tacit knowledge helps um, us um, reveal what's going on through collaboration. And it's also important here, too, that whereas before we could take a person out and put another person in, and the outcome would be the same, now when people do design work under these circumstances, you change the person, the outcome's going to change, too. So all of a sudden, the importance of people as individuals all of a sudden is extremely important, whereas before, it was almost variance. And we can put these two side by side, and we can see that they're, very, they're qualitatively different from each other. So the risk analytical business culture doubts that were arose before may be resolved by starting to replace them with a complex adaptive worldview. And now here we've got the, what would now be the complex adaptive, uh, adaptive management principles. Now, 
Um, for this audience, this is kind of the usual suspects. And what we're seeing here, what I've done here, is try to take some, some basic principles out of agile approaches and show them as, as kind of management principles that we could look, look at that we can compare to the management principles of before. And they encapsulate a lot of what we expect to see in an agile type environment. Um, and I won't go through um, in tremendous detail on this right now. Um, but I want to um, uh, just kind of highlight a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, this notion of sharing information um, is really important, whereas before we talked about centralizing information, and the reason was, was because the analysis that one does on information is going to yield the same results, so there's really no value in distributing it out. But in, in a situation where ideas emerge through collaboration with people in different perspectives, you need to push information out so you can get multiple perspectives to really understand what's going on. And in fact, you don't even know, you don't even know what information to share. You don't know what might come of that. So just the basic principle of information sharing um, is, is, is a key notion and it shows how different the same concept could be done seen so differently from a two different perspectives. And just to kind of lay, lay these two side by side and note some of the differences. Whereas before, in principle, we could identify the best solution. Here, from a complex adaptive perspective, you have to make iterative progress because conditions are changing. Whereas before, we could do it right the first time. In this case, we really need to address feedback and change course and according to that. We're applying external constraints in an algorithmic way or just to make sure that people didn't deviate from the course the plan made sense in the traditional approach, really facilitating self-organization and collaboration is what needs to be done in this world. Uh, because you don't have that information and you don't have the knowledge to do that. It has to be discovered by the people that are closest to the problem. People are production units so much as their, inc their idea incubators. And this is a really different perspective, and they have different needs and different uh, you know, situations. So this was a risk analytical business philosophy. And now what we've done is we take those that evaluate plan production, which were step one, step two, step three, and the algorithmic approach, and we kind of do a mashup with those. And we iterate through those things, applying these principles, using the feedback, through the iterative progress and the frequent delivery to get more feedback and continue in a systemic way uh, to get results and evolve the solution over time. And of course, that solution is just like that emerging technology we're talking about, is that there's possibilities that come uh, in the complex adaptive world. But the one can't really replace the other. We actually have both. There's a need of both. The world, of course, has both. There is ice and liquid and steam. We can't not see the other. We just have to broaden our view to have both perspectives. So as we looked at before, we had this idea that we start in a place of manageable risk, we get our plan, and the value um, is the one that's predicted. Now we're in a situation where we might say that if, we, if the world was covered with ice and there was a few lakes, which is maybe how it was in the early 20th century, and you could safely walk on ice, but then you hit water, and then you just go around it or avoid it. But with global warming, all of a sudden there's huge lakes all over the place, there's not, and you can't, you, you actually get stuck where you have to somehow traverse that water. You have to navigate it somehow. So really then, that's what the situation is today, is we have to start much earlier than we normally would like to, and the nature of the world in that place is liquid as opposed to frozen. And so that's why we need the new pool, the, a new way to, we need a boat, we need to learn how to swim. And the outcome that you get isn't the one that you knew you were gonna get, it's the one that emerges over time. So how do we reconcile these two worlds? For most of the 20th century, uh, the risk analytic carried more weight. And in fact, as we saw, the tradition, this whole risk analytical tradition started you know, 200 years before the 20th century. But we also saw that in the latter part of the 20th century, these other ideas started to pop up. Um, what I didn't, um, I didn't mention before was um, uh, 
the tipping point that most people have heard about. And the tipping point is a popularization of, of how complexity works in society and the world. The idea that, that progression sometimes um, have incremental steps and then boom, something transformational happens. That's how complex systems behave. And if, if uh, you know, 500 years ago technology was so slow, it, was, it didn't change any more, maybe even less than the tree outside your house, and today it's changing weekly, you need a different kind of approach or, uh, to think about how to live in that world, which is filled with the emerging technology that's rapidly changing. So that's starting to carry more weight. And as that happens, you know, perhaps we are uh, reaching a tipping point where it's not that the risk dynamic world doesn't exist, but the filter that we want to look at things is more from a complex adaptive perspective, less from that rational analytical perspective. If you look at the risk analytical perspective, complexity is that a certain thing, it's kind of annoying, I'll get it out of the way, but if you look at it, um, but risk analysis, that's of course extremely key. We don't want to, that's, that's important, we can't be successful without it. But if we look at it from a complex adaptive perspective, our worldview is more kind of naturally innovative. We're focused first on innovation, optimization second. So now we've got these new management principles um, that we've been talking about. And we can kind of go back to that problem case that we had a moment before, where the traditional governance, given the current situations of high uncertainty, were a bad fit. And what we can do is start to talk about a different kind of governance that we can now apply to substitute the traditional business case, project charter, a comprehensive specification. And the first thing I want to do is, is explore this idea of real options. Now, real options is a concept that's talked a lot about in the Agile community, often in, in conjunction with Lean, and, and we're often familiar with it, the idea of like deferring a decision to the last responsible moment, um, which if you think about it is a very practical perspective in a very uncertain emergent uh, set of circumstances. Here I want to kind of focus on a different um, aspect of real options, which is that if, there's, if you look at um, a business case that's uncertain, one way to look at that is that there's a bunch of open variables that, that need to be constrained before it could get to a point that you could get to a threshold to say yes. So real options then becomes a way to explore those ideas and those options. And you can kind of go one assumption at a time, validate, disprove, or, or, or prove that it's legitimate, and then move to the next step. And as you do that process, um, you may also stumble across new assumptions and new ideas. And so in a very... Um, 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 uh, emergent sort of way, you can either discard the idea or move on to another one. This is also an exploratory activity that could be done at a very small cost compared to doing, you know, committing the capital to do a whole project with just a little bit of information. And um, so if we think about the, the comparing the approach that, of the traditional approach of start with the expectation of ideal solution and then manage the variance till you get to your goal. Here with the real options approach in this uncertain environment, you start with a lot of possibilities and over time you explore new options and you eventually refine these ideas and at that point then um, you get to a point where business cases start to make. So we take that idea uh, that small bets can help determine direction and then if a business case emerges, uh, proceed, but keep it open. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then, of course, we'll apply Azure Project Management, which we're all familiar with. And when we do these things together, we really work together as a system. Um, and this is kind of a different thing, too, because like the algorithmic approach is first you do this thing, and then this, you know, and then you're done, and then you move on to the next. Then you do this thing, and then this, this artifact goes with that, et cetera. This is a, a different scenario where we're essentially iterating on this whole process is that we, we start with the real options. Um, it leads to emergent business cases. We mix uh, an investment. We get feedback. We decide to increase that investment or decrease that investment. It may lead to a new idea. It goes back into the real options. We do early and frequent delivery to get market feedback. So the idea is to keep the cycle going, keep the cycle going, and having a collaborative framework to exchange this information. This is going to be one of the key things is, is that in the IT community these days where Agile uh, works well, 
um, there's this, there can be information radiation as, as through collaboration. But even when, they, when it confronts the business with a different set of communication structures and policies, there really is no basis to do this kind of collaboration. And one of the things we're talking about here is that when the traditional part of the business is anchored in a traditional risk analytical world perspective, they see no reason to change. On the other hand, if they did, then there would be a way to have these common business principles could be applied across both areas, and now they have something in common. And of course, we need to collaborate. Of course, we need to share information. And so this is a heuristic and adaptive process as opposed to a algorithmic process focused on optimization. Excuse me, I'll do a time check here. How much time do I have? 30? 30? Thank you. Um, so now what I want to do is take that idea. What I just showed you is something that could be applied uh, um, to a program or a project. But what I want to do is have, let's take this idea and just try to move it up you know, to this whole idea of like the enterprise and see what might happen. So if you take the idea of business strategy, and is, is that the people that are making investments, the ones that are sitting on the cash in the US corporations, they're aware of the situation. They're looking for, they're concerned about these risks. They have motivation to come up with a different way to make changes. And if you think about it, what that time cycle and technology change, where if in, in the last 20 years that rate's changing, it's not going to slow down. And what that means is, is that there is, the world landscape can change within a budget year. It can happen very easily. So if you're stuck to an annual cycle to make those types of decisions from a strategy perspective, or even a longer cycle, then how are you going to adjust? Okay? Now, I'm not trying to say that there isn't coherence in a long-term perspective, you know, and there's an abstraction of business strategy that should be persistent and, 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 and important to um, persist. But I think a lot of what people have called business strategy in the past and thought about something they can do very rarely really is going to need to adapt more frequently. And the increment of a year, which 30 years ago might have quickly enough to look at it again and decide if we change, may not be quick enough today. And the way that's going to happen is through feedback, is through information sharing and collaboration, and integrating that knowledge throughout the organization to feed um, what the strategy should be. Capital budgeting, too, then very closely related, is the annual plan for um, capital budgeting. Also, we still need an annual process. That's the expectation that we have in the marketplace, et cetera. But, but the kinds of decisions sometimes that have been made at an annual basis, and they're not, they don't look at it again for a year, those things perhaps now should be subject to a more frequent change. Uh, one idea is to allocate capital to different kinds of sectors. So for example, if you had to use our earlier example, stuff in the green energy area and something else that was like your traditional platform, which is kind of a cash cow, the, the policies that you do for business cases in one perhaps shouldn't be the same for the other. Perhaps that would be in the green energy area, the place to put down a fair amount of money in the real options kinds of exploration, maybe either feed several emergent business cases, to use the language that I talked about before, with the expectation that maybe 75% of them will fail. But that has to be compared against the danger of sitting on the sidelines. And if, you, if you've got a technology or a service that is likely to be transformed through what emerges out of the green marketplace, you can't afford to do that. So this provides a way to play. Now finally, here it is. is this is kind of like you know, the shiny castle on the, on the hill. This is the big deal, right? That's what portfolio management. Um, that's what people are looking for. That's what they're talking about. Although I think for the most part, it's a very big fuzzball that means many different things to many different people. Um, but in this context, let's say that th this is what it means. First thing is, Azure portfolio management is active portfolio management. And if you think about it, um, if you think about it just on a personal finance perspective, is that a portfolio management strategy is one where you put down a bunch of stocks and bonds that are diversified, and then no matter what happens, you do nothing. Because if you do something, you're actually going to probably do more damage than good, is the idea. 
Okay, so, so even though there's volatility in the marketplace, you ignore that because the idea is over time that some of these things will hedge out and you'll end up maybe a little bit better than average. That's a portfolio manager strategy. It's predicated on doing very little. Now, an active portfolio management strategy is one where you actually want to respond to what you're learning. Okay, so you have to be, you have to be able to do that. And one thing I haven't focused on, and I want to stress at this point, is that this possibility of agile portfolio management did, could not exist until the, the whole IT organization was agile. Because if only a part of the IT organization was agile, it wouldn't allow enough, it wouldn't be able to look at the whole portfolio. The idea is that you have to see all those resources that could potentially be reallocated to grow other projects or downsized to grow to another one and they have to work in this type of environment, understand how to operate in this environment. So, so it's natural that we haven't heard a whole lot about agile portfolio management until recent time because there really hasn't even been any possibility of doing it until now. Now what I, I want to say is, is that if you're a single product technology company, actually you can't, there, you know, it's a different case, right? Because the technology product company and the business are pretty much doing one thing, they're getting the product out the door. They're very much in alignment in that regard, especially when it's a one product company or things are organized by product divisions where you're pretty much doing your own thing. There's a natural alignment in that case. But, we take, but what we're seeing today is actually that the majority of people who are doing Agile today are not in the software product area simply because there aren't enough people in the software product area to account for all the people being software development. More of them, vast majority of them, and this will continue as time goes on, are in tech in companies that aren't first and foremost technology companies. They're in retail, they're in banking, they're in finance, but they're heavy users of technology. Their portfolio management is a much more difficult situation because you have all these different vested interests that are trying to leverage the same cost center. So the resistance to change and the size of getting people to agree and the, the, what's really going to keep you, the, the Agile from expanding to the next level is really trying to figure out how can we communicate effectively with that typical corporate perspective um, you know, where, um, you know, to, to get to this next level. So um, I also want to do too is say that um, the idea here is, is rather than you kick off a project at, from the PMO and it's an 18 month project and all you just check in to see if the money's being spent and then hope for that, you know, that's all going to work. No, there's actually a more rigorous quarterly review concept where there were certain assumptions that were made, they've either fallen, there's new information needs to be evaluated and then you recompute the business case on the basis of that and decide is it still a valid business case and by the way, those real options things, they popped up some new ideas in the middle of the year. Now this old business case has to compete against this. This is a different perspective than the entrenched interest. All I gotta do is get my project funded, then I'm clear. You know, it could be the worst project in the world, doesn't make a difference, that decision's, you know, the train's left the station, so to speak. This idea is a different idea. That, that idea of the business case, it's open tentatively, but it has to be proven and proven and proven and proven. This works if there's a way to communicate in a rather continuous way on these things. In this case, quarterly is continuous. Also, we have, we talk about risk adjustment, but we also need to start talking about uncertainty adjustment. And um, this is something that we're talking a lot about at Solutions IQ, and I don't know that I have a complete handle on that, but I would say this, is that that model of risk that we talked about before, which is kind of that expected value model, is not what I'm talking about here. Risk is important, and at some point, risk computation needs to be part of the calculation. I'm telling you more about like a, a volatility measure, like an analogy where if you say, look at the stock market or the prices of commodity, there's times where it's very, very volatile and other times that it's not. So we can think of uncertainty more as a volatility measure in terms of an emerging marketplace. And then that then becomes, it needs to be a way that we discount our return expectations. And if that's the case, then it becomes immediately evident that instead of putting a whole lot of money in two or three investments, we need to distribute this out you know, to, in quite a few other. And immediately our, the opportunity and likelihood of us being able to uh, uh, make progress or, or have successes there. I sometimes think about that too, is that, um, well, I better not go to that right now. <laughs> uh, 
Persistent teams all of a sudden now seem more, much more justifiable. We like in the agile world to say there's value in persistent teams. And we have a lot, and we, we, when we own those teams, we know that's true. And we have a lot of intuitive arguments for that is. But now I have a, a even kind of a management principle based argument. The idea is, is that these persistent teams as idea incubators um, have invested in each other um, and leveraged and retained and developed this collaborative power and, and the ability to do this tacit knowledge integration, okay? So that, if you disassemble that, you have to rebuild it again, okay? And that's a lost value. Because from a management perspective, what you need to do, you need to create this environment that allows these ideas to be formed, nurtured, and, and brought, you know, brought to marketplace. So we put this all together. And we have our innovative enterprise. Um, really, the center of this is, is this concept of the active portfolio management, um, which is really kind of the, the, where the senior management and the people working on the teams, this the idea exchange where on that quarterly heartbeat decisions are made. Does this still make sense? Do we double down? Do we drop it, et cetera? There was not a prejudice towards something simply a sunk cost. We try to escape that sunk cost mentality. That well, we've invested in this much far, we need to do it anyway. Ruthlessly not look at it, things like in, that, in those terms. And this is the way that the organization, a way the organization can become adaptive, can be more look at the world in a more collaborative way than in a, a, a risk analytical or optimization kind of a way. So now what we do is with these new governance techniques, we have a fitting governance for the type of work that we're addressing um, that fits a lot better than we had before. And finally, um, and so this idea incubator, this, this uh, focus on knowledge, manage, um, knowledge work as opposed to production work, or I should say physical production work, is got the right framework for it to be successful. Um, Time, please. How much, yeah, how much time do I have? Oh, 20 minutes. Okay, good. Um, questions? <laughs> 